okay, uh, I've presented uh, before in the past. Um, uh, uh, my role at uh, Beeswax, I work at Beeswax, which is a company based out of California. And um, I'm director of FileMaker development there. There's a lot of really, really cool talented people that we work that I that I get a, a, an opportunity to work with so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great ideas and a lot of uh, a lot of a lot a lot going on um, we have a blog many of you are familiar with it uh, there's a couple of posts that Steve did recently Steve Senfit Herrera about Odata that are really really awesome I invite you to to check those out but there's a lot of great content on our blog and um, you know, if in case you're interested in seeing who we are, there's a there's a place for that. Um, these are different ways you can uh, you can reach out to me uh, and contact me. So <clears throat> I'm often in Germany. And this is a street in Berlin, and uh, you know, people park backwards. I, I'm a big fan of parking backwards. I like that mindset of being ready. You know, so. A lot of uh, my, my mind is always thinking of uh, being ready. As a matter of fact, um, there's a, I'm a big fan of visualiz data visualizations as well. And I came across, uh, I have to maybe find the link and post it here, but um, there's a observable HQ, which is uh, a website that does a lot of data visualizations and talks about D3, but um, Melody, uh, Melody is her name, and she gave a presentation about the 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 need for more kind of uh, visualizations in when we're coding. So, like, because coding is becoming, you know, so complex and there's so much of it, sometimes you need to have an ability to step out and see the big picture and see where problems are or see what patterns are and stuff like that. So uh, very interesting talk. I'll post the link later when I, when I get a chance there. Anyway, uh, back to parking. Uh, this talk is kind of rem uh, makes me think of the mindset of being ready. Uh, transactions is all about, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, data can be put in Atom, like in one uh, atomic transaction, all the data that you put in in different places. And there's a, a couple of uh, ways to look at it and we'll, we'll dive that in, in um, you know, when we get further into the discussion here. So I gave this talk um, already a few times at Dig FM and, and uh, no, no, sorry, not at Dig FM, at um, another user group. Yeah, Dig FM in May, in February this year, part one. And then I gave it an LA group uh, part two. So it's broken out into different parts. And this presentation is kind of mostly going to be more, more of a discussion. I'm going to skip across a lot of things that I, I talked about and more, more of an opportunity to discuss. But just briefly to highlight what I covered in part one, I talked about what we do right now, native filemaker development, transactional considerations, uh, we used to have this thing, well, we still have it, network monitor tool, but there's something even better now called release debug to measure things. And, and if you're going to get into, um, you know, anything in general that you do in, in FileMaker, I mean, we really need better tools to measure, you know, because you want to make improvements to code. Let's say you want to go and, and switch to transactional or you switch to uh, you know, unstored calcs, stored calcs, the impact that it has on your solution, you want to be able to measure before and after. Uh, release debug is a great tool. Uh, I've built some file to parse that data and flatten it. Um, it would be great. I would love some help with it to get it over the finish line, um, to get it working on Windows properly. So if anybody wants to take on that challenge, uh, please reach out to me. I'd love your help. Um, Delivering data, again, in relation to, you know, WAN performance, uh, you know, the, the impacts that uh, changes on the way you store your data, whether it be, uh, again, moving away from unstored calcs to stored calcs can have a significant impact on, on WAN uh, performance when you deliver data to users. Um, I did a little bit of transaction refresher. A lot of people here 
know about Todd Geist's early uh, posts about transactions and how they work. So uh, I mentioned that, and then I gave a little uh, demo about transactional delete and entering data. And then that was part one. Uh, part two, uh, I went more like, so part one was more about measuring and understanding. Part two was more about uh, the mechanics of, of, of transactions, what we get for free with FileMaker over the years, and then um, describing the level of difficulty, and I, and I will cover, cover that a little bit today. Um, but again, I covered again, benefits of release debug, transactional opportunities that we have where we can, uh, you know, just doing transactions on its own doesn't get you very much. You, you want to do some other things when you have the opportunity to do transactions, like store values, auditing, and, uh, and, and how to deal with blocking. So we covered that, and then I gave a demo. So I'm going to cover some of the things that are mentioned here. But again, I want to go quickly through uh, fewer slides that I had and then dive into some discussion. So free stuff, what we get for free. Over the years, FileMaker continues to make improvements in the code. And um, one of the big improvements that we've seen uh, is the caching. Caching has a big impact on performance. So uh, it's gotten much, much better. I think there was a little bit of a bumpy ride before, but now uh, you can see some really amazing uh, results. So this is like a comparison of opening a file for the first time. And, and then it caches a lot of the, the, you know, the structure, the, the, the layouts, the themes, every, everything, everything that it can cache. And again, it gets better and better, even caching uh, uh, data, I believe. And then uh, when you open the file the second time, uh, you see a huge difference in performance. So this, this stuff we just get for free just by being on the latest version, okay? This is a big, a, a pretty big deal, okay? Um, so 90%, 90% faster just by having opened it once and then going in again. So like if you're not making changes to your code and it's in use, a lot of the metadata of your system is already loaded at the, at the client. The client logs in every day, uh, you know, or every second day or every third day uh, within a two week period that cache is current. Um, so if they log in after two weeks, I believe it uh, throws away the cache and recreates it. So, uh, but they log in um, the next day, uh, their login experience is much faster. So there's definitely uh, improvements into the uh, user experience. We get that for free. Um, release debug um, is, um, is, a, is a feature that um, was came along, I, be, I believe in, in 18 or 19, I don't remember now, but it's a way that you can create a plain text file and uh, you save it at the root level of your applications directory. And, um, and you can put in for, you know, just for, to try it out, you can put in these, uh, these text strings like this. And if you want to see the, uh, the performance that FileMaker has without uh, using the temp files so much, uh, you can also add normal temp file. Although I don't really understand exactly what parts of uh, the cache or the temp files, like uh, how, how it impacts the caching. So, uh, you know, you, could, you can test it a few times and just, you know, measure performance of your, uh, you know, the, the changes that you're making without that, that flag on. Um, and then uh, look for the output in the applications directory. The output will be in a file called dbdebug.log. So you can try this right now. Uh, you know, just create a, a regular text file, put force output and remote calls. And then uh, what you'll get, what you'll see, oh, sorry, I went too quickly there. There's a great blog post on Saliance website that talks about this, these release debug flags. And um, if someone can look up that that uh, that blog post and post it in the, in the channel, that that would be uh, that'd be great. Um, this is what the output looks like. 
um, these these hash marks are redacted for uh, the server that we were we were talking to. But basically, it's uh, it's it's the calls, right? It's like, hey, I need this data, and then it, it replies. So send remote call and re reply remote call or receive remote call, however you want to read it. Um, and, and the time it took for that to process. And uh, there's a lot more details here that I won't get into, but uh, basically, uh, you know, you have the, the, the call itself. Sometimes uh, I believe you just have um, a step that, that can't really be flattened for, for whatever reason, I don't really quite understand, but it might just be like a statement of what it's doing or something. And, um, and so this gives you an indication as to what the application is doing when you're doing something. Go to a layout and you load a bunch of records or uh, run a script and it's you know, doing some operation. So this is something that I wish we had, you know, something a bit more comprehensive, uh, you know, visual like uh, Safari debug where we could just see like, oh, um, I'm loading this field on this layout and it has a value list and how long it took to load, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I've been asking for stuff like that for many, many years, but this is a, this is a step in the right direction. And it's, it's very valuable to have a way to measure so that you see the changes you make if, they're, if, you know, if you're making improvements. Um, this is a file I put together that flattens the, those records so that you see them side by side. You see the, the bytes sent and the bytes received for the specific call. And, uh, and then you see what actions are, are going on, right? So um, this is the file I was talking about. And there is actually um, a more condensed summary view so that you can, you can enter a test, run your, um, you know, uh, it's a little bit like start and stop. Basically, you start, you run your test, you stop, you go back, you do another test, and then you can uh, you can compare them. So, um, so anyway, this is I, I won't get into this so much, but if anybody's interested in this and wants to help with the effort to to finish it, I would love to get this out there. So, um, but wait, there's more free stuff, and it's not beer, <laughs> it's it's M1. Uh, it, if anybody here has one of these, um, <coughs> these machines and have been playing around with them, they are amazing. And, uh, you know, next week is WWDC and there's rumors that they're going to announce, you know, more laptops, etc. <clears throat> they're absolutely phenomenal. Um, I bought one uh, as soon as it was uh, a MacBook Pro, as soon as it was announced. And... I've been doing all kinds of testing with it and the battery life is amazing and the performance is amazing. And um, we're in for a really great ride with, uh, with when, when FileMaker uh, will finally ship a native version of this. Uh, it'll be such a, such a treat. Anyway, just watch, keep your eyes open for this. Um, so I, <clears throat> I wanna talk about level of difficulty when it comes to transactions. And I break it down into two, two categories. And, and it's like, it's really easy and it's really difficult. So the really easy side is like, I can create, edit, delete transactionally. That's, that's really easy. Anybody can do that with any basic understanding of a FileMaker. The difficult side is how to go about, um, you know, controlling like locking because there's the, the way that we're doing it that, that becomes a, a, a kind of an issue. Um, you know, maybe you wanna do auditing at the same time. Hey, you're transacting this data. While you're transacting it, you're changing it. So why not audit it at the same time? So you could, you could build in auditing. And then um, the most difficult piece is uh, moving unstored calcs to stored calcs. And uh, it might apply for a majority of solutions, but it might be, it might be uh, something that is not necessary uh, to do in in in, um, in some systems, you know. But but there is a great deal of difficulty in getting that right and having the integrity of the calculations be be correct. Um, <clears throat> so know the rules and when and how to break them. That's basically you know like all of us here 
we kind of know some, some the basic rules of building systems and and uh, you know don't quiz me on first normal form second normal form and all that stuff but you know that you know what I'm talking about like the integrity of calculations and logic and stuff like that <clears throat> so this is a, a break we have a sponsor today and the sponsor today is the emojis did you know that you can spruce up your solutions with emojis you can put them in your graph anywhere in your graph to spruce up and augment information about your table occurrences. You can also add them to scripts and put them in your script steps. And uh, so like we've been doing, uh, like our scripts will have all kinds of emojis and, and sections to them so that uh, it, it offers some visual feedback to our team, what, what's going on in different areas. So, um, the reason I mention this is because in one of my presentations is Matt Petrovsky was, was uh, you know, came across something that I had on my, uh, on my graph. And he said, hey, what are you doing? How did you do that? And I just said, it's just emojis. You can put them in, you can put a text object and you stick an emoji there and the underline, that, that line is just an underline and you can, you know, make sections in your graph so that you can uh, you know, group things together and, and call out sections uh, with visual representations, not just textual representations. So that's kind of cool. And um, it adds a little bit of, um, you know, uh, how do you say diversity and, and, uh, and uh, character to your scripting, to your graph, um, you know, even in the calculations, if you like. Um, okay, so- Sorry to interrupt you, I, if I may, have you tried yeah. this on Windows? Uh, what emojis on Windows? Yeah, I I have not. Yeah, we have. We no go. Oh, I'm so sorry for you guys, man. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out to me. I did not know. I mean, we're mostly all the projects I work on are are, are mostly Mac, <clears throat> Mac based projects, and our clients are mostly Mac. Uh, although there are some projects that our team works on with Windows, but uh, I'm surprised. I wonder, I wonder why, and I wonder when that will change. Anyway. <coughs> um, stored versus unstored. Um, so here's an example, 1,056 records. And at the top, we have a summary field showing the totals across all 1,056 records. Now, I mean, that's a summary field. Those values of number of sales, like this column here that says sales, that's an unstored count of, of the number of related sales for this country. And then the total sales is a sum of these sales here. And then this is obviously gonna be an unstored calc because it's this minus this, right? So I have three unstored calcs here. And then these summaries up here, these are based on these unstored values. So kind of like a contrived example, but you know, people build stuff like this and then they stick it on a WAN and they wonder why it's like so friggin' slow, okay? So, uh, you know, the result to go from unstored to stored is dramatic. It's, it's mind boggling, okay? So like 663 seconds to get that information versus 4.8 seconds, okay? Even 4.8 seconds is a long time. If you want you know, the user to feel your system is snappy, you know? But the difference is 686 seconds, 63 seconds is, is a system that is unusable. People will not, will not stay working in a system like that. So uh, this information, again, is used by you, you know, getting the release debug um, uh, data, okay? Um, and then just comparing the numbers here, visually speaking. Um, so you got the number of remote calls, 4,030 remote calls versus 17, okay? That's a, that's a, that's an, a great argument to say, you know, um, it's definitely worth the effort to, to go into doing this and denormalizing and storing values, okay? Um, and these are the bytes sent and received. So 99% faster and a huge savings in network traffic. So it's a really, really big deal, okay? Um, so we're gonna talk about some movies and demos, but these are the areas that I 
think are the more complex ones to, to, to deal with uh, when you're dealing with transactions. So let's, uh, let's step out of here for a second. Um, and let's go and, okay. So here is this. Um, so I get some movies I recorded here and uh, um, I'm a big fan of um, uh, time-lapse. So I've been, I've been exploring doing these presentations by, you know, putting together some time-lapse stuff. So typically, you know, FileMaker has this built-in logic where like if a user A has a record and they edit that record, uh, user B, right? Um, there's a lock that the server keeps on that record because you started editing that record. User B, uh, the record is locked for user B. Uh, they, they can't change it, right? So until uh, user A commits the changes, then uh, the record is unlocked and user B sees the new data and then they can go and make changes to it. That is the inherent um, you know, behavior that we currently have in, in FileMaker. And, and if you think about it, a system that's not so busy, you've got you know, um, users in there, um, you know, server is managing locks for different users on different records. So if you got like a hundred users and they're all editing a record, you, server's managing those hundred locks uh, on different things. And uh, a user comes along and then, and then does, uh, you know, an import and imports a lot of data. You know, server's busy doing all of that. So that's, that's an important consideration that we'll br I'll bring up a little bit later. Um, what we did, uh, to first go down this path of transactions is we said, what if we had, uh, you know, two records and then, uh, you know, let's say what we gave the user a popover. Uh, oops, sorry. We gave the user a popover and uh, those popovers were, you know, with globals in them. And, um, and then in those globals, let me move this thing out of the way. Uh, those globals, then the user would modify those globals. And then, uh, you know, there would be some scripting that would take the data from the globals, package it up as JSON, and then send it to the server and transact on that record to put the data there for that record. So the record is not locked, and I'll cover those issues in a little bit. Um, so the globals was good for the, you know, the, the start, uh, if you have single window interfaces, but it's, it breaks down very quickly. And then what you have is you have crosstalk because record one has the globals, ha, the globals have, have the data for record one. If a user has another window and wants to edit record two, all of a sudden you've got uh, the globals are now uh, being populated uh, from record two. And if the user were to go back to window one and update it, they would be updating record one with re data from record two. So it's just, it's just a bad situation. And so, um, you know, you send the updates to the server again, and then, uh, you know, that, that updates it. But th that falls apart if you've got multi windows needing multi to support multiple windows. Then what we did is we said, okay, what if, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit because this is our, our current approach. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a interesting to, to describe. So we have our hosted file. Inside our hosted file, we have a container. In the container, we have another file that we deploy into the temp directory for the user. And that file gets deployed on open. And then we established um, what we call, the, we establish a variable file reference. And then that variable file reference can, uh, can see tables inside the local file. Okay, so far so good. Any questions about that? Okay, um, so then once we do that, right? Um, you know, the file is locked. So they, you know, even if they go there, there's no data in there. Um, if they edit a record and, and they were able to go to a layout that has a record in that file, it's basically the same data that is in the record and it's in there only for the temporary uh, duration of editing that record or, or creating a record. Okay, so, so basically, you know, what we do is we install a card window and because a card window is based on a layout, 
that layout is based on a table that lives in the local file. Okay, so now we're just talking locally. We have no network traffic going up to the server. The user can you know, uh, create records, they can create related records, they can commit records. There's no network traffic going up to the server at all. This is for data entry, let's say, creating data. And the, and the cool thing is you're, you're still in the environment of FileMaker. So you're, you're just defining fields, you're dropping fields on a layout, et cetera. And so the user fills out the, you know, the information in that card window. Uh, again, this is based on the table of currents from the local file. And then when they're done, you know, the same thing, you know, uh, they can have a card window for record uh, for a window uh, to create a window to create a record in, in window one, and then in window two they can have another card record that has a different record in the local file, and that represents you know the data for another record. And so there's no crosstalk in this situation. That solves the previous problem where we had crosstalk, right? So. Um, so now we you know, save the package. Uh, so these are the basic steps here. So we, we package up the data as JSON. We send it to the server to transact on it. And then um, you know, uh, you know, if, it, if, it, if it all worked, it, it gets transacted. If any piece of that data, for whatever reason, failed, the whole thing, the whole thing uh, is, uh, is aborted, OK? And the same thing for the, the other record. Um, the, the, the couple of things to, uh, to think about in terms of locking, because we lose with this ability, I mean, we're creating data, we don't care about locks, but let's say we were editing those records, right? So the way we get around that is we build, uh, we build some hashes. So we call them past, present, and future. Okay, current state, future state, and past state. And those represent hashes of whatever data that you're editing, and it doesn't have to be the, the, you know, uh, all the fields in the record. It could be a subset of the, re of the fields that you're allowing the user to edit. And, uh, and then what we do is we just compare different ways. We compare the future versus um, uh, if the future is not the same as the past or if the, uh, the future, um, it, the current state was different than the past state, et cetera. And so like if a user, Another user changed the record, changed the data that you were going to enter before you got there. And so we can warn the user and say, hey, by the way, someone else changed this data. Do you want to just submit your changes or do you want to, you know, do you want to revert and see what they changed it to and then, you know, put in, um, you know, your changes? You know? So there's different, there's ways to deal with the hashes. And I like this because it gives you finer control than, um, you know, better control than record modification count. Okay, so you can, you can build hashes of, of a subset of fields and, uh, you know, they, they can be very, very specific. You can still use get record modification count to kind of just get a sense like, <clears throat> <coughs> has this record been changed at all, you know, and then get, a, you know, get that first uh, indication. Um, any questions about this so far? I think that's it for this. Maybe um, if I may. Yeah. When you package it into JSON and send it via API, I assume to the server, um, how do you make sure that uh, your hashes uh, are okay? Uh, the hashes are based on these different areas. So going into the card window, I take a hash of the past state and I store it in my, in my, uh, I guess my my record here, right? And then here in this record, I take a hash of what the 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 future state of the data will be if I were to transact this, right? And now I have both hashes, right? And then when I send it to the server, we calculate the current state of the hash of the data that we're about to update, and so we can compare it at that very moment that we transact it. So we have past, present, and future, like the ghost of Christmas what if, past. What if someone else modifies the record on the server just in between? Yeah, that's, that's what this is going to handle. All right. right? So, so because I'm like, I've taken the data uh, two minutes ago, and then I get a phone call 
that someone else made the change on the server. I have my past state of what I took from, from when I started editing. That's my past state. <clears throat> I go into the card window. I don't make any changes. So my future state and my past state are the same. If I click submit, I abort because like, hey, you haven't changed anything. Right. You know, because based on what I had, I haven't changed anything. If I did make changes, future state and past state are different. Okay, go ahead, send it to the server. When I get to the server, then what it does, it says, okay, I need to generate a hash based on the same fields of what the data is currently on the server for this record, okay? And now it compares that state versus my past state that I sent. Okay, so the past state was what I started editing it. That's going to be different. And it's gonna return back to the user saying, hey, record, someone else changed the data. Do you wanna sub submit your changes or not? Maybe I was misled. I have seen your previous presentation. I thought you were using um, Farmaker API to send this. The no, data. no, no, no. This, ah, okay. this is Perform yeah. Script on server. Our, okay, then it's yeah. clear. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, the next, let's see here. Okay, so this is that. The next one is a um, little bit talking about the transaction uh, uh, architecture that we have. Basically, uh, we'll see a demo shortly, but basically we have a transaction table and we have created, created by, you know, uh, et cetera in, the, in that table. And, um, and that transaction table takes a little bit of struct, uh, takes a little bit of overhead to connect every table or data that you want to transact on as a, as a, as a relationship to that table. So the transaction table is the key piece because what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a transaction record. And as long as you don't commit that record and do everything from the context of that record, you can touch any data that is related to that, to that record and including auditing, for example. So I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a, a relationship to some, uh, uh, some relationships to some data and, the, and those relationships are gonna be allow creation of related data, et cetera. And it's all using UUIDs. And then you're gonna have a pointer to a specific record. You can touch that record. You can add that record. You can update that record. You can delete that record, do whatever you want. When you're done, you commit this record and everything goes in. Or if you revert that record, everything goes up. It's that simple, okay? So um, in this example, we have a project and task table that is connected to there. Well, basically, we, we would create the record we unpack the JSON as the, uh, the, the JSON payload that we sent in. We process that JSON. We create update, uh, you know, uh, delete uh, only three relationships. Um, and then if any errors along the way, if no errors, we commit and, and that's, that's it. So the same applies to the auditing, right? Uh, we put in the, uh, the, the auditing uh, data in the, in the transaction. Um, so then uh, here's an example. Here's a transaction table, okay? And the transaction table, the only thing in that table is an ID field. And for purposes of the of example here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm just using numeric values, but you could use UUIDs, of course, we use UUIDs. So we have two relationships and these are portals to a table called parent, and we have another one called uh, child, okay? And so what we're doing, is um, I'm gonna step through this here, hold on, is it working? Here we go. Uh, so I'm gonna go into debugger. I'm gonna select the first window. I'm gonna create my transaction record. So now I have a transaction record, okay? And I'm gonna go to, um, gonna go to the uh, uh, color object. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a new color. So, uh, so now I'm, I'm touching a record uh, in the child table, and you'll see a new record ap appears down there at the bottom, right? And I start, um, uh, let's see here, I put, I put in a new value. And then as the script goes through, I'm going to remove some related records. As long as you have the keys to those records, uh, you can go to the portal and just do delete, uh, delete portal data. And that removes those records that you're touching, you're, you're looking at. Um, and then, um, you know, you can also remove a parent record. So we have, 
two records in the middle table, and then uh, we would delete that record. Now we have one record there. And so we've done a lot of these changes. Uh, we're also going to make an, uh, another deletion here. So we're going to delete some more data. And then uh, we're going to uh, change a value. So we're going to change that value. Uh, and we're going to change it to Burgundy, this one here. OK, so that gets, uh, that gets updated. OK, so far, everything has happened from the context of transaction. It has not been committed. And we've deleted data, we've added data, we've modified data. And now if I go here and I run this last step, revert, we have four records here, we have one record here. I run this last step, revert, and then we're back to what we had. Everything is reverted. It's all, it's all within uh, the transaction block of it being uh, encompassed in that block, okay? Uh, a few more. Videos. Okay, so this one here, I'm gonna kind of, this is the, the, the thing I was telling you about our, our debug, uh, our debug uh, release debug file that we use. So basically I start the test, I'm gonna fast forward through here. That was that test and basically then I would stop that test. And so this is just showing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, measuring, measuring uh, the data using release debug. So that's that one. And then I use another one, I need to do another test. And this is with stored data. So then I'm gonna put in uh, stored data. I run the test and we see that it's much faster. And then it goes back to what I was talking about before, which is, um, let me see here, the, 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 these are the results. So this is the aggregated view of what I was talking about before. And so again, I'm gonna get into now, you know, um, the, the more complex stuff, which is, um, store and moving from unstored to stored. And, um, and when you do that, uh, and if you measure it, you can see the, the, the impact, the benefits you'll get like are pretty dramatic. So, uh, okay, gonna move on here. So the three things that are, again, the three things that are the most difficult um, are, uh, you know, dealing with store, like moving stored values, auditing and locks. So FileMaker aggregation functions do not work on uncommitted records, okay? And then execute SQL function will return results from uncommitted records. However, uh, it's, it's uh, not a good thing to use aggregate functions with SQL because they can be very slow. <coughs> the, um, <coughs> the other way to do this would be just to, um, to calculate the changes and update based on deltas. Okay, so this is, this is where it gets tricky and you have to know what you're doing. So basically I uh, have a project table of a bunch of tasks, three tasks. If I were to change two tasks and change, um, you know, uh, the amounts of them, I wouldn't, if I had a, a, a stored calc that represented the, uh, the, uh, the total amount of the tasks, when I'm transacting on that project record, I can't just say, FileMaker, hey, calculate what the sum of the stored, you know, the, the related uh, task records are because those records are uncommitted. From FileMaker's aggregation functions, it will not see the uncommitted data. So you have to figure out a different way to aggregate what you've changed so that uh, the calculation has integrity. And so that's the tricky thing. And there's different ways that you can go about doing it. Uh, one of the ways that we chose to do it is by calculating the delta of the change that we have based on the value that's there okay, at the time that it's there. And then because you do that, right, and you're, you're changing that, you can, you can go hog wild on auditing, right? So you can build in auditing to take advantage of your transaction moment and say, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to audit everything I did. And then um, the, uh, in terms of locking, I already described the locks in the, in the last uh, you know, opportunity there, the slide there. And so the locks, you can do the past, present, future uh, locking technique that I described. And so that, those are, I, I think from my point of view, those are the three areas that are difficult to, uh, to achieve. Uh, again, transactions are easy to do, by getting these things in place, that's 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 kind of the the difficult thing to do. Okay, one more, one last um, 
couple of last things here, uh, just as an example, because this is our prototype that we, we build and manage. So um, this is uh, showing you, this is the local file on the right. These are two tables, okay, and the local file. And if we look, um, I'm going to, um, uh, to the graph, uh, no, I'm just showing you the, the, the fact that we have a, a file reference, a variable file reference to the local file. So that local file is deployed. It's in the temp directory uh, somewhere. And, um, and, the, and there's the path, right? So that file is deployed on the user's machine. It has no data. And, uh, and now if I uh, create a card window to create a new record, you'll see as I start filling in data, I have a new record here. And this layout is based on a table occurrence from that local file. So I can create task records. I have no task records right now. I create three task records. Uh, I'll fast forward this a little bit. I fill them in. And then uh, at this point, um, I would submit the, uh, the data and it would be transacted on the server and then entered, okay? And then the last movie, and then we could uh, maybe have uh, questions here. Um, this, uh, this movie shows, um, uh, you know, I'm going to edit the data. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna put in, sorry, did I edit the data? I can't remember if this was an edit. No, this is a create, I create the data again, I submit it. So there's the record. I have three tasks, I have $5,000 budget. I'm going to um, show the, uh, the actual transaction uh, record that we have. So because we have a transaction record, um, we store the created uh, at and created by. And, um, and in here, uh, we can see the total time it took, 1.3 seconds. Uh, we can see the, the tables that it acted on. It created a record in the project table, created three task records. And then on the right-hand side there, we see all the values that were entered for each of these fields. Okay, so that's, the, that's our transaction table. And we have a log to look at it and see uh, the relationship to the data that, that it audited. Okay, so then if we go in, and let's say we edit this record now. So we, what we do is we bring the data from the record into the local tables. Um, and now if I make any changes to this record, the, the, to that data, that data is in the local table. If I were to click outside the field, there would be no traffic to send to the server. I would uh, then package it up, send it. And then uh, you know, here we see the edits, the, the, I changed one task. I changed the project uh, attribute, and these are the fields that were changed. Okay, and there's uh, there's the um, the changes to those other fields there. Um, the the real beauty comes in how to set up the auditing. Uh, this is kind of uh, magic, and a lot of this a lot of this work is the is the efforts of of uh, again a lot of the people on on our team, and um, and and the auditing piece is is like zero coding. So basically I go here, I would toggle one of these fields. Let's say I wanna turn on auditing for uh, average task cost. Um, so I could turn that on or budget, you know, and now those fields are enabled for auditing. If I were to, um, you know, and those get audited as well on top of it all. So if I were to change the, the, uh, the, the value, uh, I get another transaction record here. The last transaction record had an edit and I can see that I changed the budget of, the, of that table. That field was not prior, it was not previously being audited, but now it is, okay? And, um, and then, you know, I could change some cost amounts. And now if I, I look at the next transaction, uh, 0.175 seconds, I had a project edit, and I can see that, uh, you know, I have some, some changes here. Oh, maybe that was not the right one. Oh, here, this one. So this, this, um, this, the average task cost changed, right? So, uh, so the auditing piece is like magic to me. Um, again, this is a lot of the work of uh, Brendan Pierce, uh, Alec Gregory, and um, a lot of other people on our team who have contributed to this. And so this is, this is what we do now to um, how we architect systems. We, we use a local file. We, do, we, we never allow the user to ever lock a record. Um, and then uh, we, we can talk about other things and imports and stuff. So that, that's it. Um, open to questions, discussion. Sorry, it took longer than I thought to, to go through all these movies, but 
Um, yeah, Hi, you're Anto. muted. Hey, Chairman. Uh, one, uh, you keep the, the log of everything, so you can basically use it like Firefox. We go click back for each record. Uh, no, we, we haven't implemented um, a way to roll back, we, we, if that's what you're asking, right? Yeah, so we, we're not doing that. We're, we're just uh, keeping a log of, of what got changed. Um, it, you know, I haven't, I haven't, you know, really do dove in deeply to roll back, but it, I guess it would be possible. Yeah, I mean, you're making the basis for it. Yeah, I, I guess I'm always concerned from, you know, rolling back perspective, like, you know, it's it's kind of like a, a brain freeze for me, because it's like, mm, I wonder, like, if someone else would have made a decision based on the data, and they their, their, their choices would have been different, uh, what considerations should we keep in mind to think that if we were to roll back, we are doing the right thing? I, I don't know. I, I, but but you're right. I mean, we're keeping um, it. I mean, we're not keeping everything because that's again. If I go back to the the auditing, right? Uh, where is it? Um, here, oh, we're choosing what to to audit. But if we turned everything on, if we really wanted to, we could audit all the the fields. We wouldn't have to audit. Um, <coughs> <coughs> We wouldn't have to audit calculated fields, although we have this option with this with this approach. We could mm -hmm. audit calculated fields, which is nice for the client. They can see like how a thing changed uh, the total amount above a budget. But uh, you're right. If we turned all these on, then technically we could roll back to that point in time. Yeah. Do you ever see a need to uh, audit or? capture the uh, reverts when two users collided and one person had to revert their record? Uh, well, because we're, we're, uh, we're creating a transaction record, we have the transaction payload and we could re retry that, that, uh, that failed attempt if, if we, if we uh, wanted to or programmed it for that. So uh, we could tell the user it failed, they could, they could try again. Um, and we, we can give them a kind of a, a message saying, um, you know, that record was in use or something like that. The, the other benefit with this is doing it on the server, the record is locked for a really small amount of time. So the collisions are shorter than if you were to try and do this, like as the user over a WAN locking that record. So there is this, there's this inherent like inflation of time where the user, if the user has the record, it's like sloth centering data, right? It's like, uh, I'm going to update that record. But so that you're, you're in for uh, collisions uh, much greater there than you would by transacting it on the server. And the measurement is, you know, measuring this stuff is really critical so that you can see like how long a transaction is taking overall, and you can measure, you know, the updates to specific records, you know, I mean, the transaction overall, if you've got a lot of touch points, you're going to lock, you're going to keep that record locked for that whole duration, right? You know, so that's, that's also a consideration, right? Um, that, sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I have another question. Uh, do you ever have issues with the local file crashing? And related to that, how often do you generate the local file? Do you generate like on first window open uh, uh, whenever you want to go to a layout to start editing records? Um, the I've never had an issue with the file crashing. Uh, I've never okay. heard of an issue there. Okay, so first, the other thing is um, uh, we, we have a, let me see if I can, uh, give me a moment here. Uh, uh, Go ahead, search. The only yeah, thing I've had problems with here is the, if when you use the double dollar as a data source, there can be mm -hmm. issues. Be, uh, I don't know why. But it looks like DNS, but still the DNS is good. So when I close the file that has the a global variable and I relaunch mm -hmm. it, the issue is usually gone. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's what uh, Toby, uh, David asked for. 
No, that was not it, but that is another interesting question. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we, have, uh, we have this approach in uh, two production systems. It's been working flawlessly. Um, we haven't had any issues for our team because we're a multi, you know, development team. Uh, different people commit different data, right? So um, we have uh, local data file management. So I can check out the local file. I can work on it. I can add new fields to it. Um, and, then, um, uh, and then when I'm done, when I check it in, um, I will get a message or a prompt, like, what did you change? You, you're checking in a file. So we have um, a ver kind of versioning built in and, um, and so, uh, so if someone else, uh, so if a user um, had opened the system and we made some changes to the local file, they would have to close that system to get the new changes, right? Um, so that's how we manage. You don't, you don't have the case where the local file maker pro client clashes and thus the file crashes and you end up in a, an unclear. State. The local, the local, the, the user crashes. Found, found like a problem of a crash on your your computers. Um, well, I mean, we haven't come across a situation like that yet. Okay. I don't know. So, but yeah. Um, so well, that's if it if the file maker client crashes, they're going to reopen the file from the server and they're going to get a fresh copy of the local file, right? Correct. Correct. We don't leave. We don't leave the local file there. We basically we just overwrite it. Every time they open a session, they get a new local file deployed. And and as a matter of fact, export field contents will actually show you a dialog. And we get around that by actually using the file write options. We actually yeah. write the file out, and there's no dialog, and it's and it's very quick. I mean, the local file is is very tiny. You know, it's like here's the local file, right? And, um, and, and basically the user would see just a blank screen like this, this is for uh, debugging and development. They would not have access to all these tables. They mm. wouldn't see any of that. They're just a local file that says, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for or whatever, you know? And then uh, if they close it, you know, it's, it, can, it stays open because it's referenced. They can never get rid of it uh, until they close the system. So, um, there, let me other show you one other thing because it's kind of cool. Um, one of the things I like about it is that oftentimes in every table, we will have, um, let me see if, where is it uh, here? Uh, no, where is it? Oftentimes in every table we have, um, yeah, here, just right here. So here, so we'll have a created by, created on, modified by, modified by, and on. And that, those are four fields in every single table, okay? We don't have those fields in our tables. We have a transaction record, uh, and then that transaction record points to different tables, table IDs for records, uh, sorry, uh, EU IDs for records in each of the tables that we transacted on. So if we ever wanted to know who is the first person to create this record? We could get that. If we want to know who is the last person to modify that record, we could get that out of our transaction log. And so we just saved ourselves. If, if you have 100 tables in a system, we just saved ourselves 400 fields that we don't have to have and keep in all of our tables. So that's a, that's a big deal uh, to me. Because <clears throat> I, like, I like this idea of like, clean tables, very narrow tables, uh, you know, that are very focused and have only data, you know. I mean, if, if you go, you guys go back as, as far as I do, you, you remember all the things that we put in, in, the, in, the, in the tables, so they, all kinds of crazy calculations to do hiding and to do other things that, you know, it's not really supposed to be there, um, you know, and, and it's gotten better over the years because, FileMaker's given us, Claris has given us better tools to, to, to do that. But um, yeah, and, and the other thing is, uh, I, I didn't know if I showed it here, but uh, we also have like a, an ability to not just do create, update, delete, but let's say a user views details about a record. 
if they go and view, we can we can write a write, run a script that sends some transaction JSON to say that this user viewed uh, you know specific fields on this record, and then if we look at the uh, transaction, we'll see that uh, you know at this time 0 0.015 seconds, uh, this user uh, this how long it took this transaction to get created. Um, this user viewed this record. Okay, so you have also maybe HIPAA related kind of uh, abilities, uh, although I'm not a HIPAA expert by far, by any means. Um, this is okay. the last session, so I'm happy to, yeah. yeah um, on, on your, the layout that uh, controlled what was being audited, um, you had the field type on there. It looked like you were using SQL style field types. Yeah, no, that, that, this is all coming. So, so if I got, so, so if I, I'll show you live here. So here's the, here's our transaction uh, prototype. So like if I go into, um, uh, sorry, that's not the right place. Uh, audit manager. So if I go to audit manager and I go to uh, our project table, right? These are the fields in that project table. If I go in and I say, hey, I want to add, um, I want to add uh, test. Okay, just added test. So now I have a new field in that project table. We have a refresh and there's test. Now I can say I want to audit it. That's it, it's done. All I have to do now is actually interface the field on the layout and all the auditing is taken care of. Like, so what I would do next is, um, I would go to uh, settings, I would check out the file, I would go to get the file, I would go add um, project create, I'd add test in here because I added it in the hosted table. Now I'm adding it to the local table. Uh, I would go back to here and we have some, um, some layouts for card add project and tasks like you saw before, right? And so here, um, uh, again, this isn't polished work because so this is this is a field that comes from the local file. Okay, so now I have it interfaced over here, um, and I could go ahead and um, you know uh, you know uh, right away if I were to create a record here, I'd have data to enter here. I would have to modify our our JSON payload to account for this data. But that's it. I, once I add that to the payload, I've added it to the to the local file. It's already in the hosted table. I'm now I'm now able to uh, not only transact data on that field, but also audit that field by by that. So very little kind of overhead to to to, to deal with, but you a could, lot of value. You could, automate, you could automate that part too. You can actually build uh, generate schema, you know, with the SQL plugin. Add that record. Uh, I Air like that. it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So, so I made the change here. What my next step would do is I upload and check in. So I would upload and check in. I would then replace this file with the new file that has the new field, and and uh, and that's it. I've already added it to the main table, and and that's it. So yeah, pretty. I mean, definitely. Um, uh, some some moving parts that you have to be aware of, but you know uh, there, there's a lot of benefit. Mm. Any other questions? <coughs> can you no. sh show me your, your DB debug file? Is it something you you can share with us? Yeah, let me find it. Hold on one second. I can't. I I, I don't want to send it out right now, just because uh, it's not in a finished state. And um, again, I wanna, uh, here, I'll show you here. Yeah, so. Because it, it's okay. really hard to, to, to read the, usually okay, so, you get the file, it's, it's very difficult to figure out how it's. Uh, oh yeah, what, no, the, the meaning of each line. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, again, this is uh, send remote call download with lock, reply, uh, remote call, download the lock. And then it has some, uh, some uh, you know, the, 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 at the time it happened, how many bytes were transferred, uh, how many bytes were sent 
uh, to the server for that call and how many bytes were received and, and the time that that happened and the duration of that event. So what I, what I liked about this is that the re release debug log is actually just uh, individual lines of send and receive, but I like to flatten it like this so that I could see it. And then the other thing I like to do is, uh, again, this is not finished. So I go here and I say, and I would say start, I would create a new record, right? And this record, then I could type in a description for what the test I'm running. And what this is doing is getting a pointer to the release debug, uh, sorry, the debug.log file. And it's saying, this is at the point that the file is at right now. Go run your test and when you're done, stop. And when it stops, it takes that marker and then it reads the rest of the data and creates log entries for, um, for that record. And, uh, and then what you can do, let me, let me get rid of this record. And then what you can do is stuff like this uh, group view. And so the group view, you can uh, you know, compare like uh, you know, with summary fields, without summary fields, uh, you know, have I made some improvements? Uh, how many total calls that I have? What are the total bytes sent, received, and the total time? So this is gonna be extremely helpful to us um, you know, for measuring, and measuring is, is, a, is, an, an, is an important aspect of, of, of what we, we need to be able to do. So that's also uh, it's, it's something that could be uh, with uh, like uh, tools uh, like Inspector Pro. You could also um, uh, say, okay, these things uh, when I, when you say when you see something like okay, it was downloading a layout or records from a table. There's the idea of the table, but uh, yes. unless you know the idea of your table, which uh, in Inspector, you can't find it. Uh, you have to show me where I can find the idea of fields and tables because I wasn't able to find it this time I wanted to I try yeah, yeah. trying to read this. And um, yes, uh, that would be really interesting to see, okay, yeah. this this download was from this table, so you, you know exactly uh, what's Actually, happening. Actually, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, we do have that data. Um, let's see here if I can find it. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, don't have it handy. Uh, we're parsing the data. It, it's, so what I'm saying is, uh, yes, I think a combination of maybe using the uh, SQL functions to pull the metadata for the file, you can get the table IDs. Yeah, from example. Then, yeah, so I think, I think it could be some really cool enhancements made to, uh, to this and, um, uh, uh, I will I will gladly share where I've gotten to once I clean it up a little bit and maybe uh, I don't have it working on Windows and I would love for someone to help me take it over the finish finish line for Windows and maybe add some of these other features. I think that was Romain, right? Roman? Roman? Yes. There's, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, cool idea. Um, happy. Does to, the data API script step give you the structure file structure? The data API script step. Uh, you can get the IDs of the uh, fields, I guess. Oh yeah, right. That the is, uh, you get a fair bit of layouts. schema information. You can, sorry, Not Ian, really. go ahead. Saying you, you can query a fair bit of the schema information. Okay, so uh, worthwhile exploring um, both of those avenues. Uh, thank you for those suggestions. Um, any other questions? I would like to add a comment actually. Um, I'm sure what your experience is uh, with large numbers of users, but mm -hmm. what we have learned the hard way that actually uh, server sessions invoked by performance script on server increase, the, I mean, decrease the server's performance exponentially. So yeah. the more concurrent sessions are open, more slower the server is, and it's not a linear uh, de dependence. Yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of transactions, and I really, really like what you're doing here, but I am uh, afraid if you unleash this on a solution that 100 users will want to use uh, at the same time, you will kill your server. Oh yeah, and so that's uh, so measuring is a big deal. I talk about it a lot. Um, uh, that's why 
that's why anything that we add, we're always met. We're always measuring uh, the impact it has. And and this is running on a kind of a, a slow server, but there's you know more performance servers, and um, you know we're always concerned. We're very concerned about the stacking, like perform script on server, concurrent running of perform script on server, and um, um, so yeah, uh, that's that's definitely something we keep a very close eye on and that's why we, we log that. In the past, we used to have um, um, a log, a PSOS log, and it would log the number of concurrent PSOS sessions running at the time that, that would run. Um, that's something that we could bring back as well. So, so if you're concerned about like a load uh, there, um, you know, that's, that's something to, uh, to definitely keep in mind. I mean, um, the overhead, there's over, like in, in the words of Chris Krim, everything comes at a cost, right? So if you're gonna do auditing, you're gonna do, you know, 10 records, or you're gonna do, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of data entered uh, via the transaction, um, then, you know, that's gonna come at a cost and it's gonna take time. You have a very performance server that's going to cut cut your time. Edits, however, they're very fast. So, like, if you're going to edit, like, if so, so if you're concerned about that performance, another way to look at it is don't do large transactions if you can avoid it, and just do focused transactions. So, like, for example, in this example here, um, <coughs> if I were to, um, you know, edit a project and tasks, maybe that might be. Uh, you know, required, but maybe you might want to just edit just the project. So maybe I just edit uh, just the project and edit the attributes of the project. So I edit, the, I edit that. And then uh, if I go look at uh, my transaction log here, um, oh, that's, that's the movie, sorry. Uh, so the, the edit will be uh, extremely fast and, and won't take a lot of time. Um, to, uh, to see that there. So that took 0.15 seconds. And, um, and that status field got changed from initialized, init initiated to approved. Um, You're on mute, Enzo. Oh yeah, sorry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I guess the, I, the, but the, I, the, the I, transaction I, could uh, be performed on the client side. If you don't want to, to, you can perform the transaction straight on the client side, no? No, no. The, the thing is, is, is we have a lot of experience with WAN users, okay? And WAN users, uh, the, the, uh, you're going to have a lot of traffic. You're going to send the data. Sending the JSON is lighter weight for that that I can see. Uh, plus, the record is locked for a longer period of time over the WAN. So... Uh, having it run on server, you're going to shorten that that window of collision right down to a smaller amount. I mean, we're talking really small time, but but the transaction again opens that up even more. The more records you want to transact, right? So because that record is part of the mix of other records that you're editing, so that that locking time is going to be greater. But then again, if it doesn't get in, the user gets notified and gives you a message that the record was edited. Um, we have it in systems where we have hundreds of users and uh, active, active use of system and the system is used worldwide and we haven't had any issues. Um, I suppose one of the other things is that depending on the nature of the records you're updating, that you've got some records that you want updated right away, whereas there might be other types that kind of taking an eventual consistency approach that it, as long as it gets updated at some point soon, that's good yeah. enough and maybe yeah. prioritize yeah. that way. Yeah, absolutely. There, there could be calculations where you don't need uh, transactional integrity, you need eventual integrity. And so you could show that record could be, you know, you don't need to add it to your, to your mix of, uh, of things that, um, uh, that, that the mix of, of, of your transaction uh, and, and you could have a scheduled script, update that record and mark that record as last updated at this time. Um, so 
yeah. Or you could add it into the uh, transaction as a separate thing. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, this is running on a kind of a not so great server. So, you know, the, these numbers would be definitely better um, in, in terms of performance, but um, yeah, that's, that's where we're at right now. It's, it's a continually evolving thing as we all know, uh, but uh, we're really happy with, with the mix of stuff that uh, this, this presents us and, um, um, you know, wanting to, um, you know, get more into uh, this discussion as, as, as time progresses. Um, any other mm. comments? Yeah, there's, uh, th there's no way to do this local file approach with, with WebDirect, right? This is only a uh, FileMaker yeah. client. Yeah. However, uh, we we explored, uh, you know, uh, instead of doing this, we thought, oh, why don't we just create this into like a web view? And it's all kind of in a web viewer. It's using uh, web techniques and JavaScript to, you know, let you edit that data. And then as long as we can package up the JSON in our transaction JSON format, uh, this that could work on the web for web direct, no problem. The other approach would be to uh, instead of having a local file for that, and there's uh, again there's pros and cons. Um, in my opinion, more pros than cons uh, would be to have hosted file, hosted tables for this, and then um, you could still do it on web direct. But you know, it 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 it, uh, it is something that. We, we do very little web direct in the sense of, uh, of uh, manipulating data. We have web direct where we use it just for viewing data. And so we don't, we don't make use of, of, this, of this approach there. But uh, what, what about maybe looked at uh, like going back to the globals approach for web direct, because then you can't have, you know, two windows open anyway. So you wouldn't have that conflict. Yeah, potential. I mean, uh, Again, we haven't explored it on WebDirect, and uh, and the other thing is is uh, having a web a web view here, having to maintain that code then requires other kinds of skills, and uh, we have those skills. It's just it adds that kind of uh, technical debt to the to the project. I mean, at one point when we were moving from globals to a popover a, a card window and and thinking about local file, we even went as far as saying, hey, why don't we just do all of this with the data API? Why don't we just send it to the data API and transact it with the data API? But that turned out to be like, oh, wow, no, that's, <laughs> that's definitely not something we wanna maintain. Um, it's, it's more, and, and we can't even achieve this level of transactional complexity. I mean, you could do anything you can do in the local file in terms of related structure, you could present it in a window here and it's all local. There's no traffic on the server. So going back to, uh, I guess, was it Jan who made the comment of, you know, server being busy, you're reducing the busyness of the server to not have to worry about all these locks that other users. So let's say a hundred users are, are putting in data. Um, those hundred users um, are doing data locally and only when ready it's being sent versus, um, you know, having the uh, the uh, the data acted on or locked by by or live different records locked by different users, uh, <clears throat> and um, so that's um, that that's that's also a, a worthwhile consideration. And so, I have yes. I have a, a colleague that can uh, launch any script on server side. Uh, what you are doing is to only launch the transactions uh, going back and forth between the client and the server, and uh, that will free up all the space you mentioned. But when you do a complex report or something, you might end up with a, with a scenario that uh, the guy that doesn't say the name, it says blue pill only on his name. He, uh, Jan, is okay. it? Jan. Oh. Yes, sorry, I've been asked by Yoris to co-host. My name is Jan, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. The scenario you describe, where you say that the, the server gets exponentially slower. 
It's what, what kind of scripts are those? Any. It simply perform script on server, increases the, uh, the, the load on the server. And the more sessions you start uh, simultaneously, the more exponentially the load grows. And it's a lot more resource intensive than standard database operations. We have, we have a, a project with, that is supposed to roll out for about 1,000 users. We now are at 100, and we have to uh, uh, forbid any perform script on, sec, uh, on uh, server calls. Or everything we want to happen on the server, we have to queue, and we have one, or actually more, but we have a queue processor on the server, so there's just one session. If we have those hundred users doing some stuff that calls performance on server, the server gets killed if there are twenty or thirty together trying to do that same thing. Yes, and because it's I, performance script on server itself. I have rebuilt a couple of scripts, especially those that are generating reports. If it's a print to PDF or something, and it's uh, issuing an email, those I do as an export XML. I wrote an XSLT that uh, generates a PDF through LaTeX. And that removed a lot of extra resources spent on the server. But the small pieces that uh, Enzo here shows that you do uh, a subset of fields on a table to edit them, uh, though they will spend a lot of resources as it's a separate session, just like you have a separate FileMaker uh, client logging in, uh, the time it's using, I mean, it's like the multiplication table from uh, primary school. Uh, you will have uh, five boxes high and maybe half long instead of having uh, it 100 long and uh, three tall, this box. So it changes the equation. Uh, the, the way Enzo built it, it's not new. It's called MVVM. There's a model, there's a view, and there's a view model. Uh, this, there's a lot of uh, literature on this, and it's always used in iOS. Um, you don't have to use JSON, but it's very nice to use JSON because you can just paste it into a different project, the sample data from FileMaker. And, um, uh, but Enzo, did you notice any difference if you, you edit one field opposed to 100 fields or... I don't know yeah, if you have uh, yeah. up to 20. Yeah, no, there's definitely there's definitely a difference. I mean, here, uh, that's, this is a live, a live demo, right? So let me edit. So this, this test, uh, test demo. And so if I edit the project and the tasks and I make a change to the date, to the, just to the, just to the date. Okay, let me just, just to the date, change it. Okay, so let me go, let me go look at that transaction. So that was 0 0.312 seconds. So I uh, I edited the date and there was an edit to the project as well. I'm not sure why. Uh, let's see, so hold on. Uh, so here, here's a better example. I'm going to edit just the, uh, the status, right? So I just edited the status, 0.35 seconds, right? So the status got it. And now if I, if I entered, whoops, what happened? Here, okay. So if I go and I edit two fields, um, uh, hey, oops, uh, this is a, a trigger that got added. Okay, so I got two fields edited. So now I went from 0 0.3, mm, 0 0.2, not a, not a good example. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like if I were to edit more fields, uh, you know, you have let, me, let me add some more, uh, more records. Um, I added three more records to the tasks. Uh, put in a date. Put in a date. Change the budget um, to seven thousand. Change the status. Change these amounts. Change these status. So I did, I did a lot of changes. I'll even delete the first one. Okay. So go go ahead and create that. So that that took. 0.9 seconds and all these changes. So, you know, if you if you do if you do just a single record with fields, again, the, the, the server this is running on is 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 it definitely 
this would be much faster on a, on a better server. But uh, just to give you an idea, like Jermug was, Jermug was saying, um, that um, you know, more fields, more time. You know, mm -hmm. um, and and we could turn off the auditing, but the auditing is a big value. If you turn off the auditing, it's going to be even faster. Just transact the data. You don't have a log of it, but it would transact it correctly, um, and and it would be faster. So, but the auditing is a key component. Um, this sort of illustrates the difference between patch and put in the HTTP. Uh, what's realm the difference? Of and what's the uh, difference? Patch is if you if you do the HTTP call called patch, you only edit the selected number of fields, uh -huh. while a put will always update all the fields in the table. Oh, I see. OK, that's it. I didn't know that. OK. Um, so uh, Jan, the, the really important thing is to measure. You need to measure so that you know if you have the script that is running PS, PSOS, um, if there's a way that uh, I think I think I got to look up a, a blog post that I, I might have done about PSOS. I mean, it's evolved a lot since we we did it, and we haven't we haven't gone back to it yet. But um, I, I should revisit that. But you know, putting in the ability to log the script is going to have overhead, but it's going to give you a lot of value because then you're going to be able to see like, um, am I am I are any users running PSOS scripts? Are any of them stacking up? And uh, we had this visual representation as well. The more Concurrent scripts would stack up, the, the redder it would get. The rows would get redder and redder, three, five, 10, 15. Uh, at some point, um, even though FileMaker says you can have 500 concurrent script sessions, you'll never get there. <laughs> you'll, you, it's just, uh, I, I think it's the number of cores times two. That's probably the right formula of, of concurrent script sessions. There's a, there's a, a little, a few details to, to make sure you, you also consider with... Um, um, I've seen at least 150. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> you have so many running and, and the performance is still good? Yeah, it's a two times 28 cores, so... Wow, I'm jealous. <laughs> well, there are other problems there, so... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Run out of those. Uh, mm. I was gonna, are you going to share this file? Eventually, uh, we're waiting for some other, you know, I, I think this one is going to be longer delay than, uh, than, than this file. The, the de release debug file, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get that out. Um, we'll get this one out soon, um, but the other one is, is going to have to wait. Um, uh, I, I would love for this to catch on as an approach, uh, but um, we're waiting for other things to fall in place before we... we okay, we then that. I have a question. How yeah. do you, how do I how do you deploy this uh, local file? Oh, you, when, you weren't somebody... here before. Oh, you have showed it already. Okay, then I'll no, okay. Uh, roll back. <laughs> no, no, but I just very easy. Uh, you basically on open the local file is embedded in a container, and you just write it out to the temp directory, and then you get the path to that temp directory, and then you establish uh, uh, an external data source with that uh, global variable. Mm -hmm. And that's that's it. And that's it. And then once that's done, um, once that's done, then uh, your local file, uh, any any tables that are in here. I mean, the really cool thing, the really cool thing about this, right, is uh, I have a table in here called Project Create. Inside, whoops, inside my graph here. Um, sorry, this this is a local file. Uh, here. Inside here, I have project create, right? And that's coming from the local file. Okay, that's a table that's aliased on here from the local file. The really cool thing, as you all know, is that um, I, I can, oops, let me close this. I can, uh, where is it? Um, this, this layout is coming from that table. This layout uh, is as is a, is a, is data is a, the ta the underlying table is is from the local file, and th this this relationship is also on the graph. Um, where is it? Uh, what's it called? Uh, task create portal. 
So if I am here, it's these two right here. Okay. <clears throat> Nifty. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. That's and, and, and this and this is the the kind of overhead that I'm talking about for the transaction itself. So, um, so we're we're looking to simplify this and make it easier. But uh, that that's what we have right now, and we're uh, we're pretty happy with with uh, with this. The, the, this is the exploratory file. What, what we have in production is a lot cleaner and, and, and better, but this is just like where we, where we sort out our ideas, so to speak. Um, yeah, this is a general then, approach, right? The one you yeah. are in production is specific, specific to the specific. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we just, have, we just have projects and tasks here just to, to prove out our idea and and work out the, the 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 you know the logistics of our transaction JSON, but then obviously the production file has you know 20, 40, 50 tables, whatever, and it's it's got what it has. So um, I know I've gone way over, uh, but I have one last thing I want to share, which is really exciting to us. And we do a lot of we do a lot of work with Tableau, so um, there's something cool that's coming. And so currently. Uh, we do, uh, we've been, we have been using Web Data Connector and uh, we have something new that's going to be, uh, it's going to blow the socks off of Web Data Connector and we're really excited to, to get it out when it's, when it's uh, ready. But this is, this is a, a comparison of Web Data Connector versus this new thing that we're going to come out with. Uh, 2,700 seconds to refresh an extract of 1.1 million records in a table in FileMaker versus 115 seconds. So very, very excited uh, to get this out. So um, that's it. <laughs> get inspired, try new things. And uh, thank you for teaching me and allowing me to share, uh, you know, uh, whatever I've been up to and uh, exchange ideas. Um, Okay, and, thanks uh, for a great session and uh, yep. see you tomorrow, guys, or tonight. Okay, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Bye.